The topic is an important one for anyone who cares about American competitiveness in the financial services sector, a financial ecosystem that empowers users over bank CEOs and other powerful central decision makers, and the next iteration of the internet in which individuals are able not only to read information and write content, but also to own a piece of the networks themselves. This doesn't seem like a new financial system per se, but really an extension um, or perhaps expansion of our present one. Well, I, I would disagree with that. Um, I think what, what I believe we're seeing is a new open infrastructure layer on the internet, uh, a missing infrastructure layer of the internet that is designed around value exchange and economic coordination um, that is rooted in uh, you know, immutable data, the ability to interact with counterparties in a very, very safe way that hasn't existed before on the internet. And really, many of the um, efficiencies uh, that the internet brings in terms of moving information brought into moving value, uh, but also with greater degrees of security than are often offered through the existing financial system. So I, I really do believe we're building a new global economic infrastructure layer. Uh, in your view, is additional guidance defining clear rules of the road for investors and market participants needed at this time? Thank you for the question. We believe this is a very important area of focus for the SEC and this committee. We do agree that the laws are clear. However, existing laws, regulation, and legal precedent make it clear that blockchain tokens are not securities. So we believe that the law clearly shows that blockchain-based digital assets are one of two things, either a new form of digital property or a new way to record ownership, as Brian Brooks spoke earlier about. We do believe that clarity is needed because these are new assets. It's a new way of transacting with these new protocols that we spoke about, and I think it would be benefit all of us in the ecosystem to have agreed upon definitions. I think from the standpoint of what's available in the market today, one of the things that we need to do better in this industry, and I think we're working in that direction, is much like the early days of the web, we need to focus on uh, consumer-oriented uh, products that, are, that have a lot of information about the, con the, the challenges and also brings the person through from a literacy standpoint. So they understand, you look at user experience, you look at UX design, all of these things are really, really important. And as we saw in the early days of the web, it happened. It came together. We, we became better at educating the, the audience about what's available and what's out there. The nice thing about blockchain is you have immutability. You have records that are out there that can't be changed. This information is already leveraged by Chainalysis, for example, in Elliptic to demonstrate the different things that are happening on chain. And I think it, off, it, it allows us the opportunity to create a lot more foundational efforts with respect to user experience and focus on these consumer protection issues that you're talking about. One of the really innovative properties of cryptocurrency markets are 24-7 risk monitoring engines. We do not have overnight risk or weekend risk or holiday risk in the same way traditional assets do, which allow risk monitoring and de-risking of positions in real time to help mitigate volatility. Um, we've been operating for a number of years with billions of dollars of open interest. We've never had customer losses um, clawbacks or um, anything like that, um, even going through periods of large movements in both directions. Uh, we store collateral from our users in a way which is not always done in the traditional financial ecosystem to uh, backstop positions. And the last thing that I'll say is if you look at what precipitated some of the 2008 financial crisis, you saw a number of bilateral bespoke non-reported uh, transactions happening between financial counterparties, which then got repackaged and re-leveraged again and again and again, such that no one knew how much risk was in that system until it all fell apart. If you compare that to what happens on FTX or other major cryptocurrency venues today, there is complete transparency about the full open interest. There is complete transparency about the positions that are held. There is a robust, robust, consistent risk framework applied, and we're excited to work with the CFTC on our uh, U.S licensed and regulated venue um, to bring a lot of this uh, to U.S. customers as well. Uh, as digital assets become more common in the global market pace with the total digital asset market reaching almost $3 trillion, as Ranking Member McHenry just said, how do we ensure the U.S. dollar remains a reserve currency? Well, Mr. Lukemeyer, it's terrific to see you again, and um, I'd give you a couple of thoughts on that important question. One is, if we start with stable coins before we talk about other crypto assets, I've said for a long time that the secular reduction in dollar holdings as a percentage of global central bank holdings is alarming. 
And this has been going on for more than 10 years at this point. So dollars as a share of the European Central Bank, the Japanese Central Bank, uh, et cetera, has, has shrunk from 80 plus percent to more like 60 plus percent in a short amount of time. What that tells me is that in the future, with the rise of China and other major economies, the US dollar can't take its primacy for granted, and we need to start thinking about competing on utility, on features, not just based on a post-World War II monetary system that we could take for granted for the last two generations. And that's one of the reasons that I've been such a supporter of internet-enabled dollars, which allow us to compete on features, not only on history. I think that's really critically important. The second thing I would tell you is, as we enter year 11 or 12 of a highly inflationary environment, after all, we've been printing enormous numbers of new dollars since the financial crisis, there will come a time, gradually then suddenly, when the attractiveness of the dollar relative to other currencies could change. One of the benefits of the crypto economy is that it creates some counter incentives on the part of the Fed to do that kind of policy because people will flee to other kinds of assets. And that sort of market competition is something that I think will ultimately shore up our monetary policy and keep the dollar where it rightfully ought to be, which is as the dominant reserve currency it's been for all of our lives. Can you uh, talk about the difference between uh, a stable coin versus a central bank digital currency and what advantages do, 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 does a stable coin offer that, that a digital dollar, say at the Fed, would not be able to offer? Thank you, Congressman Barr. I, I'm happy to. I think the first difference is that uh, stable coins are operational and growing in the market today, and they're built on uh, an open internet technology model. So when, when we think about all of the things that we've seen built on the open internet, on these open protocols and networks, whether it's ubiquitous information exchange, communications, interaction around the world, that same open internet model is the foundation for stable coins. And so uh, I think that's a fundamental difference. A, a CBDC, which is a, con a concept right now, it's not operational, would very likely be a very closed loop technology that's tightly administered and run by the government uh, and would unlikely be ac accessible in the same way that these open networks are accessible. And so I, I think that's a, a critical difference, but I, I, I would come back to the most important, which is that most payment system innovations in the world have been driven by the private sector. And I think what's taking place today with digital currency is, is no different. Uh, can you talk about some of the negative consequences that could happen if we take a heavy-handed approach to regulating this developing technology? Well, I come back to Mr. Vargas's question a second ago, which I think is the right way to answer your question. You know, Mr. Vargas asked the question of um, people have the potential to lose a lot of money. These things are volatile. They're risky. How do we protect them from those kinds of issues? There are two ways of answering that. One is to prevent as many people as possible from accessing this amazing technology. For, for example, the way the current legal regime works is certain kinds of assets can only be purchased by accredited investors, meaning rich people. So the only people who can get rich on this are people who are already rich. That'd be one way of protecting people from losing money, is to make sure that only the richest can access it. Another way of addressing it would be to make it safer the way that we made equities safer 40 years ago, right? We created mutual funds, diversification, sector funds, and other things that make it easier for regular Americans from places like my hometown in Colorado to buy equities without having to be stock experts. Strangely, in the US, we've refused to do that so far. So we don't allow crypto mutual funds. We don't allow people to diversify the way that they do in Canada, Germany, Singapore, the United Arab Emirates, and a series of other regulated economies around the world. So I would argue the way to win is to bring more people into the system more safely, not to keep them out at their own peril. So I represent the South Bronx, which is often said to be the poorest congressional district in America and of greatest concern to me are the use cases of crypto that would improve the lives of the people of the South Bronx. I represent a heavy population of immigrants who often pay predatory fees in order to send remittances to their loved ones abroad. So what can crypto, blockchain, Web3 do for that Dominican immigrant in the South Bronx who is burdened by remittance fees that she cannot afford? How much more affordably and quickly can the crypto economy facilitate remittances Mr. Cascarilli, if you could take that question and please be specific. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think this is a really important element of the technology, uh, which again is that it's open to anybody. Uh, you don't need to have a bank account. Uh, you don't need to 
um, in fact, rely on any intermediary. So somebody who's an immigrant and wants to send a remittance to a family member in another country is able to do that. And um, uh, there's ways to do it with both crypto and to do it uh, with a stable coin. And all you need to do is download a wallet, and then you can send it to somebody else anywhere in the world. And so this is a really powerful um, uh, tool for democratization of access, especially for those who have difficulty getting bank accounts. There's no minimum fees. There's no minimum balances. Uh, there's no check cashing fees um, that are part of this technology. And you can do it in some cases for you know a penny or less. One Bitcoin transaction, uh, a single purchase, sale, or transfer uses the same amount of electricity as the typical U.S. household uses in more than a month. And so this is really outstanding to me, and, and many folks do not uh, know this, many Americans and folks that are talking about this issue. And so, Ms. Dixon, can you explain why for a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin that rely on proof-of-work model mining uh, is such an energy-intensive process? Thank you for the question. This is a really important area, obviously, in terms of sustainability and uh, the focus on what we do in this space. We should always be trying to do it better and much more efficiently. Uh, the in Bitcoin is the proof of the the way that Bitcoin consensus is achieved is through uh, really complicated math equations, and so there's a lot of energy that's need to, needed to be used to be able to make that happen. Um, I know best about the the consensus mechanism on Stellar which is the Stellar Consensus Protocol, which can be done on a very small computer, any of the ones that you have in front of you. And the, uh, it, it consume, we had a University of Lund did a study on the Stellar network itself, and the uh, network is, is low in terms of energy consumption. It's around 0 0.00022 kilowatts per hour for each transaction. That's less than a transaction for Visa. So that's a really important comparison for us all to think about. So not every consensus mechanism is proof of work or proof of stake. Again, there are many, many different ones out there. And depending on the mechanism, it depends on the energy consumption. But it's definitely important for us to be able to try to do this better, more efficiently, and to consider the sustainability concerns around it.